My favorite part is getting closer to my friends and learning more about Jesus. I like the free time, I like Vespers, and I like Camp Fire. Uh, what was my favorite part? non score. My favorite part of camp has been Camp Fire because I just love singing the songs and I love to scream them too and the dance moves are always fun. I've made a lot of friends. I get to meet a lot of people. I made a lot of friends in our cabin and just in general around the camp. We've been learning about base camp and it's about preparing for the moment that you go out to the real world after here at camp and you just go spread the gospel. How, how much God cares for, for us personally and how important it is to grow um, in our relationship with Him and, and to work on our heart and our, and our mind and our soul. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in clean pastures. He leads me by still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You are rod and your staff, they come for me. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Noah and just about practically all of Genesis. Um, I've been learning about rest and how God is our shepherd. I learned that you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior to get to heaven. My daughters, after they have went to camp, they come home and they seem very refreshed and knowledgeable about God and ready to spread the word about God. It's super fun. It's really fun. I mean, you get to you get to meet a lot of new people and like the motto, you learn about Jesus. One thing I love about Cowan is when I come here, I see that kids my same age care. They care about growing in their faith. And I know sometimes when we go back home, we're like, I swear, it feels like no other kids my age want to grow closer to God. Like, I can't find them. But when I come here, I like, they're like, they're here. I found them. I like, I found my family. Name 
shining down on me when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Now there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out of the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name Good morning. Y'all can go ahead and take a seat. And good morning and welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church on this beautiful tail end of April Sunday. It is a pleasure to be in each and every one of you and all of y'all out there watching whenever, wherever you may be watching the live stream or the recording, you, we welcome you as well. I don't know about you, but watch that video. I recognize some people in it. Yeah, I saw some people in it, and I'm trying to put my finger on exactly what's special about this Sunday. What, what, today, what are we celebrating today? Camp Cowan. Camp Cowan, oh, that's right, it is Camp Cowan Sunday, and it's awesome to see the video and know that these wonderful children we have up here have a great time and love going up to camp, and so they're going to lead us in some song, and we are going to have a great service and worship and honor God and just enjoy Camp Cowan, and camp season is starting really soon. It is here, the weather's warmer, and we're ready to go. But a few administrative announcements I do want to get out of the way here quickly. One, I was asked April 27th, April, Saturday, April 27th from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. That is going to be the Abundant Life class meeting, and it will be pizza, not potluck. Yes, I was one. I was told to make sure I was clear about that. Pizza, not plot luck. April twenty seventh at noon for the Abundant Life classroom, and also this popped up seems really cool on Saturday, May the eleventh at six p.m. There will be the homecoming and Southern Gospel hymn sing. Um, that will be here. That's on your calendar, and you got look at these cool. That's the Grand Old Opry microphones on that. Right there, right? That looks pretty good right there. So please put that on your calendar and be considering that. And that, as far as announcements, is what we'll focus on today so we can get out to the service here. And we'll go home. I think we're going back to songs now. Am I on? Okay. Um, Hello. In my role, I get the opportunity to go to camp with children and to also go to events with youth. So today you're going to hear some songs that we sing at children's camp to get them up and moving and dancing. And then later we'll do some more serious songs that the youth do. So our first song, you might as well stand up because you're going to be dancing. And jumping. And shouting. So just follow the words. If you can. And if you were at Bible school this summer, we did this song. So you've heard it before. It's real easy. It's real easy. I've got a river of living water, a fountain that never will run dry. And it's open heaven, we'll releasing, and we will never be denied. Cause we're stirring up deep, deep wells, we're stirring up deep, deep 
waters we're gonna dance in the river dance in the river we're stirring up deep deep wells we're stirring up deep deep waters we're gonna jump in the river jump in the river deep cries out deep cries out to you deep cries out deep cries out to you we cry out we cry out to you, Jesus. I've got a river of living water, a fountain that never will run dry. And in open heaven, we'll releasing, we will never be. Cause we're stirring up deep, deep wells We're stirring up deep, deep waters We're gonna dance in the river Dance in the river We're stirring up deep, deep wells We're stirring up deep, deep waters We're gonna jump in the river Jump in the river Deep cries out, deep cries out to you part and if he goes to the left then we'll go to the left and if he goes to the right then we'll go to the right we're gonna jump 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 in the river jump 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 everybody if he goes to the left then we'll go to the left and if he goes to the right then we'll go to the right we're gonna dance 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 in the river dance 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 everybody if he goes to the left then we'll go to the left and if he goes to the right then we'll go to the right we're gonna jump 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 in the river jump 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 everybody if he goes to the left then we'll go to the left and if he goes to the right then we'll go to the right we're gonna shout 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 in the river shout 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 deep cries out deep cries out to you deep cries out he cries out to you, we cry out, we cry out to you, Jesus. He cries out, he cries out to you, he cries out, he cries out to you, we cry out, we cry out to you, Jesus. I'm tired now. I can't sing anymore. All right, before we continue on in songs, we'll have our call to worship today. And our call to worship is Psalms 103, verses 17 through 22. But the loving kindness of Yahweh is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them. Yahweh has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless Yahweh, you his angels, mighty in strength who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless Yahweh, all you his host, you who serve him doing his will. Bless Yahweh, all you works of his, in all places of his rule. Bless Yahweh, O oh my soul. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you, humbly come before you in gratitude, in gratitude of our ability to have ministries at camp and at Parchment Valley, the opportunities that we are still, as a congregation and as a West Virginia Baptist Convention, able to provide for our young folks. We pray your blessings on this summer and all the activities that are going on we pray your blessings and guidance and wisdom be upon our youth we pray father you're leading them and guiding them and providing for them we pray for us as a church pray for us as parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and mentors father god that you give us the wisdom give us the courage to lead and direct towards jesus christ and it's in his name we pray amen amen Lost my microphone there. How many of you found little Jesuses today? Where's some places you found little Jesuses? <laughs> Was he baptizing himself? <laughs> okay. Actually, we found this idea online, but we decided we wanted to do it because Jesus is everywhere, so we put him everywhere. I think he was in the bathrooms. He was in your Sunday school rooms. There's still some Jesuses up here. There's some on your pews. There was one in the elevator. Um, so if you didn't get a little Jesus, you can take one home. But uh, last night, the youth went to, uh, we had a progressive dinner. And at every place we went, we had a little Jesus time because, you know, that's what we do when we're in church. And the last place we went, we were ask, I asked him the question, what's something for the rest of the school year in the summer that you want Christ to show you? And help you. And one of the adults there, and it wasn't one of the adults on the stage, said that he wanted to notice. He wanted Jesus to help him notice, to notice the little things, the things that we tend to overlook. So what we want you to do is take this little Jesus and that remember that whenever you have a Jesus, he's everywhere, and a little bit of Jesus <laughs> Our next two songs are not songs that you may be familiar with, you may or may not. But they're songs that the youth really like to sing, and they have a really good message in them. And the little Jesus goes along with this next song because one of the lines in it is, there's nothing better than you, and we all know that there's nothing better than Jesus. I search the world but it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough When you came along And put me back together Every desire now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you, and you still call me friend, because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Let's hear it. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. 
turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better. into armies you turn seas into highways you're the only one who can you're the only one who can you're the only one who Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. 
Let's pray for our tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, we are humbled and grateful in our humility for all that you've given, all that you've blessed us with, the tools, the resources that have been given and lasted us throughout the ages, Lord God. You are good and we praise you. We pray you take our tithes, pray you take our offerings and utilize them to glorify you yourself, Father, and we pray that you take all that we have and all that we do throughout this week and glorify yourself through us. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See if that works. All right. Good morning, everyone. Technology. It is just absolutely wonderful because it can make you very humble very quickly. All right. There we are. I think we're good. Welcome to Cowan Sunday. I hope that you have been blessed by the youth. If you ever want an extra blessing, come out on Monday nights at 6 o'clock. Sit down and eat a meal with us, 6.30. We'll have a time of lesson, activity, fun, singing. It's a variety of things. It changes week to week. But we are thankful for the privilege that these teens give us to join into their week each week and to have a little part in their lives. And as you've seen through the video that opened the service, as well as just the excitement up here, Cowan is a special place. It's a place where lives are changed, where people meet the Lord, where we step away from the busyness of life. Anybody want to step away from the busyness of life? Okay, then sign up to be a counselor downstairs, okay? <laughs> and that's all seriousness. I'll tell you, it's the best week you'll spend. And uh, there is information downstairs near the door where you came in. And so following the service, I hope that you'll go down, pick up information for yourself or for someone else. And uh, if Debbie will be there if you have questions. I'm volunteering her. That's one of those things in your job description as a pastor assigns. Uh, but she'll be down there and, uh, and be able to answer questions. But I hope that you will be in prayer now for the camps this summer. The camps at Cowan, camps at Parchment Valley. There is an exciting plan. And the theme this year is Brave. And so we're going to be talking about being brave for Christ as we go out and live in the world. Being Cowan Sunday, and as I was planning sermons months ago, I chose to center around the theme of children. And so if you have your Bibles, it will turn to Mark chapter 9. We'll be reading verses 33 through 37. So if you would stand with me, uh, it's in the bulletin. It may be up on the screen. Thank you. Uh, you can follow along. Mark chapter 9. Verses 33 through 37. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he had placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, 
whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. May he bless us as we apply its truth in our hearts. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. You have brought us to this moment and to this place. We thank you for these teens and their investment in our service this morning. And Lord, we just thank you for them as they engage you in worship and join, let us join with them. And Lord, today as we would pause to look into your word, I pray that your spirit would fulfill his great work in our lives to bring to reality the truth that we find there and to help apply it to the very depths of our being. Lord, I pray that you would help us set aside the distractions that will come in the next few moments. Worries about what tomorrow holds, worries about later today, or Lord, anxiety about the yesterdays of life. Help us to set that aside with your help so we may focus our eyes upon you, our Redeemer, our Savior, our King. Father, I ask that you take these very simple words I have prepared. And allow them to be a means by which you speak your very message to the very depths of our hearts this day. I pray in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. You may be seated. If you were here last Sunday, you saw we were just earlier in Matthew chapter, or Mark chapter 9, that Jesus has taken that retreat. He went north. He left Israel for just a, a few weeks, and he travels to Caesarea Philippi and on to Tyre and Sidon. And then he comes back, and as he comes back in, we saw last week, he takes James and John and Peter up on this exceedingly high mountain somewhere along the northern border of Israel as a time away, and he is praying. And as you saw, we call it the transfiguration. Jesus' very countenance changed. His clothes became whiter than anyone could bleach them. His appearance became radiant. Peter, James, and John got the privilege to witness a little glimpse into Jesus' deity, to his glory, to his majesty. They saw a little glimpse, just a little crack into seeing. And you remember what Peter's response was? I guess everybody was sleeping last week. That's all right. I'll tell you. He wanted to stay. Lord, let's build three tents, three tabernacles, three booths. Let's just stay here. Let's not go back down. This is great. You know, and Peter, James, and John got to see Elijah, and they got to see Moses, and they recognized them, didn't have to be introduced. They knew who they were, just like we'll know everyone when we get to heaven. Just a little side note. And it's just so exciting and then when they come down the mountain, Jesus says, don't tell anybody what you've just experienced until I rise from the dead. Because he's told them earlier in the week, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be turned over to evil men who will put me to death. And I will rise on the third day. See, they'd heard it. They'd heard the announcement. And now Peter, James, and John saw this little glimpse. And they come back down the mountain. A lot of things happen, but... They go back to Capernaum, to home base. And as they make their way there to that region right there on the north-northwest side of the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus for two years has gone back time and time again, whenever he's in Galilee, he seems to always center back in Galilee. Many there know him. Great ministry taking place. But as they make their way there, the disciples are arguing. Okay, Peter, James, and John just had this experience like they've never had before. They have visually and experientially seen the glory of God. They've seen Jesus and his glory. They've had the Shekinah glory of God come and envelop them. They've had this experience unlike, and they heard God himself say, what did he say on the mountain? Anybody remember? This is my Son, whom I love, listen to him. The other nine didn't get to have that. And as they're on their way to Capernaum, they're having that little side argument. You had those when you were kids. Maybe you had siblings traveling with your mom and dad in the backseat of the car, arguing who was going to get by the window next because this, my time was long before AC. It was windows down, 55 miles down the road. Hopefully no rain, Right? Some of you are laughing because you've been there, all right? You have those arguments. 
You know, and, and Jesus hears them arguing on the way, and they're arguing the whole way to Capernaum about which of the 12 is the greatest. I mean, Peter, James, and John just had this experience. Peter is a little bit egotistical in his personality. Would you not agree? I mean, Peter's often, no, he's just jumping right in, both feet. He's jumping right in with all of his mouth and all of his thoughts and all of his heart. And it's great to be all in, but sometimes he's a little off base. And I can just imagine the discussion they're having, but they're trying to have it quietly. They don't want Jesus to know what they're arguing about. And they make their whole way to Capernaum. It's an ongoing argument about which of the disciples is the greatest. When they get to Capernaum, Jesus and the disciples gather in a house there where they're staying. And Jesus has the disciples come and sit down with them. You ever get called to your mom and dad's room? We need to talk. See, that's one of those talk moments. Jesus wanted to have a talk with his disciples. Because the whole way to Capernaum, all they've argued about is which one of them is going to be the greatest. Now remember, James and John's mother had already come to Jesus and said, Lord, I want you to put James and John to right and left. Those are the most high places. Remember that? <laughs> You know, it's not like it's not been through their minds at least once. And now with this mountaintop experience in which they didn't want to leave, they wanted to stay there forever. Jesus says, come here, guys. We need to talk. And as he sits down, which is the position of the rabbi when he's teaching, we have this all backwards. I think every week you all should stand and I should sit down. Okay, That's how it's supposed to happen. All right. In Jesus' day, it did. Jesus sits down, he calls them to come to him, they gather around him, and he says, guys, I've got a question. And I think there was a pregnant pause, a moment. He says, what were you arguing about as we traveled here? You ever get caught? It's like, oh, he heard us. He didn't have to hear him. He knew their hearts. He knew their minds. He's God the Son. What were you arguing about? And then he gives them that answer. He says, you know, the greatest in my kingdom isn't like what you think. Listen, guys, in my kingdom, the greatest is the one who takes the place that's least. And see, in that culture, they knew that picture when you had a servant in your house, you would have a servant and usually more than one. And there was one who was the lowest guy. And his job was to wash your feet when you came in the door. And they didn't wear closed shoes back then. They wore open sandals. And it's quite dusty and quite dirty. And bathing wasn't a regular every morning or every night event. And so washing feet... Wasn't very pleasant. That was the lowest disciple. And nobody <laughs> wanted to wash. Just think about, fast forward a few weeks, which we just looked at this just a few weeks ago around Easter. When they're in the upper room, none of the disciples volunteered to wash everybody else's feet, did they? They went to the table with dirty feet. It was Jesus who got up and then washed their feet, and every one of them wished they had done it. So Jesus wouldn't. But then we're back up a little bit. Just a few weeks before that month or so and he says to them what were you arguing about the greatest one in my kingdom is the one who serves all one who's willing to humble himself who recognizes the position i've given and it doesn't go to their head but they see that position and empowers them to then become the least of all these and then he takes a little child the greek there's pation he takes this little child, this little toddler. In my mind's picture, he's, it's a little baby who's just beginning to stand and walk. You been there? I mean, they're just wonderful when they're at that age. As a parent, soon after that, we ask ourselves, why do we teach them to walk? <laughs> okay? And, and our oldest didn't start walking. She just started running. It didn't have a walk stage. She just took off. All right? He takes this little pation, this little child, this little toddler, and, and he sets him right in the midst of the disciples. 
That toddler needs a lot. That toddler needs someone to protect him, right? That toddler needs someone to provide for him. Maybe if he's young enough, you might just to help him clothe him. Been down those roads? <laughs> Trying to get the outfit on your child and they're squirming in every direction possible? We do that to God sometimes. But he's always successful. He's going to need someone to correct him when he's wrong. That toddler's going to need, right? But one thing about that toddler, one thing about that little child they have a lot of trust. I can remember my oldest, not long after she could walk, in the house we lived in back when she was little, top of the steps, eight steps from the one level to the next, and she's there, I'm on the other side of the room, I think sitting on the couch or the chair, I'm not sure, and she stands at the top and says, catch me, daddy, and jumps. I was a little younger back then. She surely shaved a few years off my life in that moment. But you know, she had no doubt, that'll be there. Right? That's something about a little toddler, a little child. Whew. Another one of my kids, Candy Cane, came with Santa in the little bag, you know, the cell phone bag, the little Candy Cane, and I handed one to her, and she dropped on the ground. We didn't realize it. The fire truck drove over it. Did not burst the subtle vein bag, but it shattered and crumbled and powderized the, the candy cane. And my child brought that to me and says, Daddy, you can fix this. <laughs> See, toddlers have some faith. Toddlers have trust. Wow. And I don't think it's by accident he chose a toddler, a patio, to sit right there, right in front of them. Because he wanted them to have a visual picture of what it meant to be greatest in his kingdom. To be one who is relinquished to God. That means we've given up, folks. We're not fighting God and trying to tell him we know what to do. We start every moment of every day and saying, Lord, <laughs> I don't know, but you do. It's a good place to be. Good place to be. We need his protection, we need his provision, we need his correction. And then Jesus picks that child right up from the midst of those disciples, and as he holds that child, he says, listen, whoever accepts one of these little children, welcomes one of these little children, you literally are welcoming me. Think about that. That's something to chew on for a moment. When we have this heart that is so moved with compassion to those around us that we don't see them as for necessarily how everybody else sees them, but we see them through the eyes of the Lord. And as we welcome them into our lives, as we allow them to come in and have a piece of who we are and, who we, and what we do and things that we're engaged in, as we welcome them into our lives, even the least, we're welcoming Jesus. Isn't that awesome? If you want to welcome Jesus in your life, welcome the least. Welcome the little ones. Welcome the children. Welcome the teens. Welcome them. Invite them. Encourage them. Breathe life and inspiration in, into them in your life. And he says, listen, not only when you welcome them, you're welcoming me, but when you welcome them, you're welcoming me, and you're welcoming who? My Father in heaven, you're allowing him to have a peace in who you are. You're allowing him to invade your life and to engage your life and to guide your life and to direct your life and to employ you as this beautiful vessel he's created in the image of God Almighty so that you can touch the world around you. See, they wanted to know who was greatest because they wanted to know who was going to be top dog. But folks, in God's kingdom, the greatest is not top dog. It's the least. It's the one who serves. It's the one who sees this world every moment of every day through the eyes of God Almighty. 
And I think in addition to that truth that Jesus is teaching there, he wants the disciples to see the importance or the priority of children. Because in the first century, folks, children did not have any standing. They were to be present, but not heard. Seen and not heard. Quiet, in right place, acting right, dressed right, perfectly there. But, and, you know, that's not how God sees it. Jesus, on another occasion, welcomed all the children. The picture in my mind is that lap overflowing with toddlers and arms filled with infants, and he's blessing them and praying over them, hearing the stories and laughing at the humor. He wanted the disciples to catch a glimpse of that relationship that God wants. God puts priority on children because he wants us to learn that we must approach him in the same way. We must come to him as our father. We must come as that child, that pation, that tachna, that little child that needs nurturing and care, provision, who's filled with faith and trust and awe of who he is. Jesus puts a lot of priority on kids. Throughout his ministry, in a culture that did not, he did. More than once. And the few times it's recorded, I think, was just the tip of the iceberg based on what John says at the end of his gospel. I think it was common. And he wanted the disciples on that day to see, if you want to be great, be least. Be servant. Become like that child. Have that childlike faith in me. Don't fret life. Don't worry through life. Don't let your joy be stolen away. Don't let circumstances and situations and events come and rip away the things that God is blessing you with. Folks, they come, right? Boy, maybe I'm all wrong, but I think it happens to everybody. It happens in my life. I think it happens in everybody's lives. Life happens, and it's not neat, and it's not clean, and it's not orderly, and it's not convenient. But I'm called to engage it with this childlike faith, this trust in God, this faith in his provision, holding on to his hand, especially when the world is spinning out of control. He's who I hold to. He's that anchor point in my life, to have that childlike faith faith and know that he is always faithful and if we have that call in our lives then friends we've got a responsibility we have a responsibility to the children and youth in our lives for some that may be our own children or our grandchildren or our nieces or our nephews but it goes beyond that it goes to the children in our lives the neighbors the friends for all of you all, you saw a little sampling of children in your life, right? Right? This is part of our church family. These are, these are, these, we're, we're, we're accountable. And we have a responsibility to pass on to them the truth, to pass on to them the knowledge, the understanding, to pass the baton of faith on to them so they can pass it on to the next generation as they live it out. We have a responsibility because it's important to pass our faith on. And whether it's literally in our family or it's in the church family or it's beyond the walls of the church, it's our call to be those who are investing and passing life on to, Jesus on to those around them. As the youth last night went through the church, they put a little Jesus all over the place. And just like Debbie said this morning, a little Jesus goes a long way <laughs> see it's not a little dawn or a big dawn or it's, it's a little Jesus just, look, just, just allowing him to season my life allowing him to impact my life allowing him to work through my life we have that responsibility and I believe in this passage he's saying to those disciples who thought they were something to realize they were nothing for the benefit of even the smallest of children as he took that child to set before them. We are called to point them to Jesus. 
But we can't point them to Jesus if we aren't pointing to Jesus. You follow me? I can't give them what I don't have. If I don't have Jesus focused in my life, then my passing on to them will not be a focus on Jesus. I can't tell them to do that. I must show them, which is how we teach our kids anyhow, right? You know, remember the faces you made when you were teaching them to eat? You were trying to teach them how to chew? Right? Some of you are smiling because you remember doing it. Maybe you're in the midst of it. You're pointing them to Jesus. You're helping to see Jesus. You're helping to understand who he is. You're helping them to follow him. You're helping them to grow up in that faith so when they are out on the world on their own, they can continue in that pathway. And our prayer is they will, but they'll have to choose it and make it their own. But our job is to point them. Our job is to direct them. Our charge is to lift Jesus up so they can see it. It's for us to pass on to them our faith, our faith in Jesus, to pass that baton so it's theirs. And when you pass that baton, the critical moment is not in the middle of the track running the pace. It's in the exchange. And folks, we need to be diligent. We need to be intentional. We need to be all in. And the question I'll leave you with this morning, Jesus, I think, makes clear children are a priority. And if we engage them, we welcome them, then we're engaging him and we're engaging the Father and we're fulfilling his plan. So will you do it? Will you pass on your faith? Brothers and sisters, those of you who've made Jesus Lord of your life, walk in it, live in it, engage so people can see at least a little bit of Jesus in you. And if you've not made that step into faith, friends, today's the day. Today is not by accident you were here for this sermon. I believe God places us where he wants us on the days and times he wants. I at least believe that. It's not accidental. It's not some sort of fate. It's God moving and he's moved you. And if you have not accepted him, we want you to. To receive him as your Lord and as your Savior. In just a moment, the youth are going to come back up and lead us in a final song. It's our invitation. And our invitation is threefold. It's an invitation first that if you haven't accepted Jesus, we want you to. We want you to come into the kingdom. We want you to walk in relationship with him. We want you to know him like we do. And we invite you to make that choice today. To step out into faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you're feeling called to do that, if you're feeling the Spirit's nudge, then come up front and I'll be here a shepherd will be here, and if we get busy, another shepherd will come. You just come. We want you to come into the kingdom. Because it's the greatest decision you'll ever make. And we want you to make it. And brothers and sisters, as we walk with the Lord, life happens. Man, I can tell you, life happens. And we can feel overwhelmed at times. And maybe you're at that place right now. And life just feels like it's crushing you. Come, let us pray with you. The altar is open for us to come and pray and bring our burdens and talk to the Lord and renew our walk with Him. If God's calling you to do that, please come. And if you'd like to be a part of our church family, we welcome you. It's a time to come and let that be known. If God is speaking, hear His voice. Respond to Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this morning. We thank You for Your truth. We ask, God, that you would be with us as we would come to sing this final song. Lord, I pray as we sing the words, it would not simply be words, but, Lord, it would be your message to our hearts and to our lives, that we would be found faithful to follow you. Lord, if any this morning need to choose you as Lord, that today would be their day. Lord, if we just need to refresh, renew that walk with you, that we would come and allow you to guide us back to the right path. Lord, if you're calling us to be a part of this church family, that we'd step out in faith. We give the invitation to you, Lord, and as we sing this song, may it be the desire of our heart to pass on the gospel, to pass on the truth of you, Jesus. 
to announce to the world, salvation is in you, our Redeemer, our Savior, our King. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing, pass it on. It only takes a spark to get a fire. I pray that you go out and pass that good news on this week, today even, as God will give you opportunity. Just as a little bit of logistics, I know that several of you will be staying for the funeral for Lou. And so we would ask that you would go ahead down to the gathering areas of the family and those that need to get things set up for the funeral service at one can do that. At about 12.30, we hope to have everything in place and the family would invite you to come up to have a time of visitation with them. From 12.30 until 1, the service will be at 1 o'clock. I thank you for being here today. May God richly bless you. Thanks for giving the youth the opportunity to share and making this Cowan Sunday. If you want more information on Cowan, there's some information downstairs. Catch up with Debbie. She can share that with you. And I pray that God richly blesses you as you go from this place. God be with you.